Okay. Um, thank you very, thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me to join the discussions. Um, just as a little bit of background for those who don't know me, um, I'm a lawyer, and I've specialised in international law of the sea and environmental law. And my research focuses essentially on new activities, new actors, new technologies in the oceans, on the oceans, under the oceans, and to what extent they can still be effectively governed by the legal framework that we have that was negotiated largely back in the 70s before we even had an understanding of things like climate change, etc. So from this perspective, I'm interested in the ocean cleanup, obviously a really good example of a completely new activity that was not foreseen back in the day. And what I'd like to do today is just um, walk you through the general international legal framework. So that's the obligations of the Netherlands under international law, the obligations of the ocean cleanup under the agreement, the 2018 agreement that Loika already mentioned. And then I'll zoom in, of course, uh, for today on the environmental obligations and finally say a few things about the legal relevance of risk and of having a better understanding of the risk involved. So, Lonica already talked us through this in more detail. Um, the Ocean Cleanup is a, a, a private legal entity under Dutch law, a foundation and a private limited liability company. And what they do is essentially a restoration activity. So this is quite a new thing, that private entities actually take the initiative to go out and clean up some of the rubbish that we have put into the marine environment in this case. And they're doing this in what we call an area beyond national jurisdiction. In this case, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is on the high seas. So that means that no single state has sovereignty there. No state can enforce laws there, except for vessels that are flying their flag. Because the Ocean Cleanup is a Dutch legal entity, there is such a thing as a general obligation under international law that we call an obligation of due diligence on the Netherlands, to make sure that any activities under their jurisdiction and control do not cause harm to other states or to the marine environment. So it's important to just bear in mind here that international law is the law applicable between states. So it's made by states, it's applicable to those states who consent to be bound by it, and it is also enforced by states. So there's no such thing as an international police that can come and tell states off when they haven't complied like we have in the domestic level, which me means that it's very political, right? So that's a little difference to bear in mind. And it also means that the ocean cleanup does not have obligations under international law because they're not a state. They have obligations under Dutch law. So that's sort of two levels that we just need to bear in mind are separate. They're connected, but they're separate. Um, so this picture you might have seen, or something like this, um, this is <coughs> the sort of framework of jurisdiction that is set out under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. This is sort of the big international convention, a kind of constitution for the ocean, that sets out quite comprehensively who can do what where, what states can do where and under which conditions. So on the far left you have the coastline, the coastal state, and then it basically divides the ocean up into different zones that are completely artificial. I mean, fish, they do not stick to these lines, obviously. And for today's purposes, we're all the way out here on the high seas, so outside national jurisdiction. Under UNCLOS, states have certain freedoms of the high seas. So this means that all states have equal rights to conduct certain activities on the high seas. Think freedom of navigation, freedom of fishing, um, it obviously doesn't list the freedom to build installations to clean up plastic on the high seas, but it is a non-exhaustive list. So if an activity is not on the list, doesn't mean that it's not allowed. And on the list is, for example, the construction of installations. The cleanup system is an installation. So that could fall under that freedom. But then all these freedoms have to be exercised in accordance with international law. So then the next question is, what rules are applicable to the ocean cleanup? And this is not immediately evident. I mean, it's not clearly a vessel. It is not extracting or harvesting a resource as such. So there is not a dedicated set of rules immediately applicable to the system. 
And this is why the 2018 agreement was concluded. This is where the Dutch government es essentially sets out which rules it sort of picks and chooses to apply to make sure that it acts in accordance with international law and sort of extend that into obligations on the ocean cleanup. So it sets out the core responsibilities and liabilities of both the Netherlands and the ocean cleanup. So this is essentially a contract. It's a two-way um, agreement. The only two parties to this agreement are the ocean cleanup and the Netherlands. It works the same way if I were to conclude an, a contract with you here. We're the only two parties. And um, on the final point of the flag, so the system does carry a picture of the Dutch flag, but it's not presently, unless you know something I don't know, registered on the Dutch flag registry. It's not, yeah, it could be, because on the Dutch law, you only need to be designed to float. So it's, <laughs> you're designed to float, so it could be, it could be done in the future. But um, currently it is not. It mainly depicts the connection of the installation with uh, the Netherlands. So the agreement that they've chosen to do is to apply the rules that you find in UNCLOS on marine scientific research by analogy. Um, and the question is, of course, what does that mean? Um, what it essentially does is it treats the activities of the ocean cleanup as marine scientific research without calling it marine scientific research because it technically is not. But it does provide a body of rules that you have under the convention that, for example, says something about how to operate marine scientific research equipment and installations, which is relevant for the ocean cleanup, and also how to balance that operation with other users of the high seas. So on the one hand, it provides somewhat relevant and recognisable rules for the Netherlands to comply with, and also it means that at this point the ocean cleanup didn't need to change anything about the setup of their activities. And then it focuses on roughly on three pillars on maritime safety, so it makes sure that the, um, the system carries all the things you would find in seagoing vessels, so GPS trackers, things that make it show up on uh, radar, etc., automatic identification system lights the lot. And it makes sure that if it comes into interaction with other users or users of the high seas, that then the ocean cleanup cooperates to avoid any damage or repair any damage. And the third pillar, which is what we're interested in today mainly, is of course the protection of the marine environment. Uh, it also sets out that any damage that is caused by the ocean cleanup for which the Netherlands is held liable under international law, so if an other state comes to the Netherlands and us for damages for anything that was harmed or um, harmed by the ocean cleanup, then the Netherlands can recover any costs from the ocean cleanup. And all obligations are still fairly basic because this was concluded before the first prototype was towed onto the high sea, so it's still quite early days. So it's still quite ge uh, quite general, and the agreement provides for a yearly review um, where the parties see how implementation is going and then any changes or amendments or additions can be made. So I will now zoom in on the environmental obligations, firstly of the Netherlands under international law, so we're on the top level of law now. The Netherlands under UNCLOS have a general obligation to protect the marine environment and that includes marine biodiversity. And this is again what we call an obligation of due diligence which means that it is an obligation of conduct rather than of result. So the obligation is not to make sure that there is zero harm occurs, but rather to do everything that could reasonably be expected of you to assess any risk, to minimise them, and to just... It's sort of a duty of care, essentially. So sort of subsets of that are the obligation to conduct an environmental impact assessment, to adopt the precautionary approach when you're not quite sure of what the effects of your activity might be and take any other measures uh, required to prevent, reduce and control harm. There's furthermore a specific obligation in regard to rare or fragile ecosystems which could be relevant with regard to the Neustin or any of the habitats of depleted, threatened uh, and endangered species which links into other obligations under, for example, the Convention on Biological Diversity, 
to which the Netherlands is also a party, which is dedicated to the protection of biodiversity, including uh, on the oceans. And finally, there's a rather obscure provision under UNCLOS that tells you not to transfer damage or hazards from one form into another, which could be relevant here because the ocean cleanup is, of course, targeting uh, a source of pollution rather than a resource. So how have these obligations of the Netherlands been translated into concrete obligations for the ocean cleanup under the agreement? Um, first of all, it contains the obligation to take precautionary measures, which reflects the precautionary approach that I just mentioned, to cause any damage uh, resulting from the activity, including specifically to species in the area of operation. It also requires a monitoring plan, which curiously is limited to one year of operation, um, which is a bit odd, and that international law you would usually find a continuous obligation of monitoring, so it's probably wise to just keep that rolling as long as the activities take place. And finally, the obligation to remove any parts when they are no longer used. Then there are a few um, gaps, in my mind, in the environmental provisions under the agreement. First of all, it doesn't contain an obligation to conduct an EIA, which can partly be explained by the fact that the initial EIA was already done before this agreement was concluded, and for the very first prototype, it is quite small, there is no clear risk of significant harm to the marine environment, so you can debate whether an EIA was necessary for that. However, as soon as any of the parameters would change, so as soon as the system would become bigger, or indeed as soon as they're going to scale up to a fleet, then there would be an obligation to conduct a renewed EIA, so that's something um, that I think should be addressed also in the agreement at some point in the future before the scale-up phase commences. Um, and indeed, in the whole agreement, there's no real differentiation between operating one system, a single prototype, or multiple systems, um, and that applies to the environmental obligations as well. Again, I think that's something that should probably be addressed in the future, but that's work in progress. Um, and finally, as I said, all obligations are general, and the same applies to the environmental obligation. So there's no specific standards imposed or procedures that need to be followed. And what you could think of here are exactly the points that Lonica already raised, how to deal with bycatch, an obligation to at least minimise bycatch, or how to deal with biofouling. There's a lot of experience with that in the shipping business, which doesn't apply directly because ships move a lot faster than your system, so there's a bit of a... Of a, of a disconnect there, but that these are things that could be addressed in more detail. And my final few points, and then I'll leave time for questions, is that this is a new kind of balancing exercise, and this popped up in discussions just before. When you think of conventional activities at sea, these are all um, resource, they're all extraction, they're all extraction related. So on the one hand you have a recognised right of states to exploit something, be it fish, be it oil and gas minerals, and on the other hand you have the obligation to protect the marine environment while you do so. So the two interests involved there are economic and environmental, and they're both recognised rights and then the balance is struck somewhere in the middle, most of the time leaning more towards the economic side. And this is different in this instance, which is quite unique and quite new, because the objective of the ocean cleanup and the need of everyone in this room is protecting the marine environment, improving the condition of the marine environment. So it's very much in line with that general object under international law to protect and conserve the marine environment. But at the same time, the activity as such might pose new risks to the marine environment. So then there's a question of how do we weigh two different stresses on the marine environment and where do we put that line, which weighs heavier? So there's not a lot of guidance or indeed a concrete benchmark in international law of policy that can give you an awful lot of guidance on that because it's a new, a kind of new kind of balancing exercise, which is why it's so important to gather more data, to gather more knowledge, to develop this practice and to make an informed decision, um, which links into my second point is that, of course, understanding these risks better is legally relevant for existing obligations. As soon as it's clear that there is 
a risk of harm to the marine environment, there is more weight on the obligation to assess these risks and to monitor them continuously. Also, in regard to the Newston, if that would prove to be a particularly vulnerable or unique or important ecosystem or part of the ecosystem, that would uh, trigger a higher standard of care required than if that is less important to the ecosystem as a whole. So this is why we need data, why we need better knowledge. And that links again to my final point that for things we do not know or that are uncertain at present, puts more weight onto the precautionary approach until we, need, we know these things. And I think perhaps the final point I'd like to make here is that I think there's therefore also a real opportunity here, both for the ocean cleanup and for science more broadly, in that this is activities for the first time actually gaining experience with direct interaction with the news and with that top layer. So it's a great opportunity to gather more data, to gather more knowledge, but also to develop operational practices, um, maybe develop best practices. And if that is done with a certain measure of transparency, that can really feed into future activities as well as to uh, into future policy making on this topic in the future. So I'll conclude on that point. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any more specific questions you might have. Thank you. Yeah, that's a very interesting presentation. I have to admit that I'm not uh, an expert at all at this topic, but um, and I don't know actually how this, uh, like, um, I understood that this device is not classed at the sea. So in that, uh, for instance, this device. So in that case, it means that the country, uh, like the flag of registration rules do not apply. And I would, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's like a really good idea to have these devices operated uh, in the high sea for various reasons. But if you have them there, I think it's more or less you can do whatever you want. And uh, because like no one controls that. And I do not actually see uh, the rationale behind like the Netherlands or any other government having an agreement with uh, an NGO. Uh, because it, I mean, to me it doesn't make much sense. In, uh, in, uh, if I'm, I'll try to explain myself a bit uh, more on that. It's like uh, I can't see the reason why the, um, any NGO or an operator should have an agreement with the country for an operation that will take place in the high seas, where actually no one has any control. And uh, I actually see a risk that if there is a viol, I mean, if a state thinks that there is a violation of the uh, uh, union clause then they are going to go to the court of justice. So if you have an agreement, uh, like if these two countries uh, don't uh, have an agreement, um, they might actually sue the country that has the agreement with uh, this. So I, yeah. I, I actually I think it's a huge risk of having this, because if I actually have an NGO and I operate in the high seas, no one is going to actually uh, help me uh, responsible for that, I think. Now, if they actually get me to the court, the, uh, Court, uh, the International Court of Justice, if I have an agreement with the country, they might start to actually, uh, you know, it's like they might sue the country mm -hmm. that has the agreement with me, mm -hmm. and I think that's a huge risk, and I think any country, any state should avoid that. Yeah, so I understand your question, um, which is exactly why there is an agreement. So if anything happens that another country would not be happy with, with regard yeah. to the ocean cleanup, they cannot sue the ocean cleanup, they would take, if they want to go that far, which is quite unlikely, they would take. They would hold the Netherlands accountable, exactly. they would take the Netherlands to court. And then what the Netherlands has to prove is that they have fulfilled their obligation of due diligence. So that the Netherlands have to prove, no, look, we took measures that could be required from us to make sure that the ocean cleanup activities were conducted in an orderly fashion, which is why there is that agreement with the ocean cleanup that says, okay, these are our obligations under international law, this is how we translate that into what we expect from you to comply with these laws. So it is actually a precaution in that part, on the part of the Netherlands, because there are no dedicated rules, also not on the Dutch law, on ocean cleanup systems, to set out very clearly which rules it find applicable and where they expect the ocean cleanup to comply with. Yeah, but uh, the thing is, like, 
the problem, I, I think it's, well, my opinion is like that's very stupid of the country actually that decided the state that decided but, to do that. But if no country do that, uh, no if one they one wouldn't, if they wouldn't do yeah, that, let me, let okay. me ask you, uh, uh, it's like you have like a company or an NGO operating somewhere, they do something, I mean this has happened uh, like, uh, we have many cases for instance with Greenpeace and other environmental organizations, but they have vests, and Greenpeace then we have like other laws. Uh, um, well, I mean, we have the IMO, we have like uh, other... Uh, um. Now the thing is, you have like someone who is operating in the high seas, okay? And they, they pollute, let's say, they do uh, damage. Um, a state can actually uh, go to the court, as you said, and then they are, they'll try to help the company liable for the damage. Not the company, the com country no, 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 responsible. The company, the company, the company. They can't now, hold the company liable. I mean, the correct thing is like uh, the company are operating, you have actually to go against the company. Now, if they have uh, an agreement with the state, mm. it means that the state is responsible. But that's, uh, I mean, I don't see any rationale of like the state uh, in being involved. Like, I mean, uh, why are they responsible for what the private uh, organization or an NGO is doing? Yeah, it's like I operate in the high seas. I mean, yeah. I, I can do like drug trafficking in the high seas, for instance. Yeah. Okay, and they, uh, they, uh, I'm called. Why is state is responsible for like me doing something uh, illegal? So this comes back to the two layers I was trying to sketch. So on the international plane, the state is liable towards other states. Yes. Under domestic law, the private entity might be brought before a domestic court of the jurisdiction, whoever has jurisdiction. Um, so if you're trafficking du uh, drugs into the Netherlands as a private actor from the high seas, you can be brought before a Dutch court. Yeah, but we're talking but about that's a different seas. level. We're talking about the high seas, so what You cannot about? bring private actors before an international court because international law does not apply to private actors. So you can have, s at yes. the same time, the state can be liable and the private actor can be liable under different systems of law, under different courts. Yeah. Well, uh, okay, I mean, it might be complicated, but what I wanted to say is that if you do something in the high seas, actually if you are uh, a company or like an NGO, actually nothing is going to happen to you. So like trying to get someone uh, involved, it's actually risky for the state. I mean, the state agreed in that. Yeah. But there's also nothing more shady than an NGO operating on the high seas without any contract with anyone. That's like the most shady thing I see, and I'm pretty sure they lose all the time. So you really need to find one. You have like uh, 100,000 vessels operating in the high seas. Yeah, but an N the NGO needs funding from someone. Yeah. And, and something I happens. Know nobody would fund an NGO that doesn't have, uh, that operates on the high sea without any contract with anyone or any clarification of what they are doing. Okay, and the Dutch government is now uh, responsible for yeah. an NGO just because it's a Dutch NGO. Yeah, but because they're kind. Is that because they are? Kind. Yeah, exactly, that's what I mean. Big. I use like a stronger word for that, but uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, that, well, yeah. We, we can discuss so. further over on coffee, maybe. Do you get another question? Yeah, legally, I was just wondering if you could help me understand what significant damage means in an environmental context. Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. So, with these environmental obligations, and that's maybe something I should have highlighted, um, these, when you read them, they're very vague, right? What is significant damage? What is What are the measures reasonably uh, uh, expected of the party? So this is entirely case-specific. So what it then comes down to is that you build an argument on the basis of the circumstance of the particular activity in that particular area of operation, which is, again, why you need the data, why you need the knowledge, and then build on the basis of those particular facts an argument that, yes, there was significant harm, or yes, the standard of care was met. Because, of course, you can't, you can't determine that sort of in abstracto for any activity on the high seas, what is reasonably required, because it depends entirely on what you do, where you do it, the circumstances, the scale, all these factors. So it becomes a very factual argument that might shift the balance to one side or another. So in science, when you say significant, you usually mean like below some... For the probability that you observe that by mm. chance, is that is there any kind of so when you say like significant damage in a legal context? A risk of, so you don't have to have risk. proven it yet. Okay, so yeah. you, you just demonstrate that there's a 
high chance yeah. of significance. And you don't, and how you define significant is sort of dependent on That's the, the argument context. for you to substantiate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so it was negotiated throughout the 70s and it was concluded in 82. Yeah. So you also mentioned that it had some really bad evidence. Did the, yeah. did the convention predate biodiversity or has it evolved then? It's, um, that's a really interesting question actually. So the, the convention itself doesn't mention the word biodiversity anywhere. Um, it's, it's environmental provisions actually talk a lot about pollution, preventing pollution. And the international courts subsequently, over the years, interpreted that to include all forms of uh, pollution, including damage to biodiversity. So protection of the marine environment, they interpreted in line with later conventions, such as the Convention on Biodiversity, to include that in the general <coughs> obligations under our laws. So it doesn't say so in as much words, but it does have that legal meaning now. In the name of carbon, climate change, space, you have your annual reports, and you know, so everything comes back to the nation states and this, the, the UN and the FCCC thing. Is, that, is, there, is, there, is the same going on in, in this space? Is this was a, can we say the US has this toyogy here of, of plastic waste in the UK? Is that, is that happening or is it emerging? Um, no, so it, it works a bit different. So in, in, in the UNFCCC space, you have this reporting mechanism which is kind of the only way in which it is somewhat enforced. So countries have to show this is what I've done, and then if they haven't done enough, there's sort of a naming and shaming. That's really what you can do in terms of enforcement. Under UNCLOS, it is different. We have a dispute settlement system. So there's not none of this reporting going on. But if a country were to breach any of these many obligations under the convention, any other party to the convention can take them to court for a breach of that obligation, which has happened for environmental provisions, think South China Sea arbitration um, was all over the news. China was building artificial islands on top of coral reefs, which clearly damages the marine environment, so they were uh, they were found to be in breach of that obligation, for example. Presumably, following the deal that we took, if this Dutch uh, deal were by Dutch people, If they would, yeah, I, I think you won't come close to being it's comparable to building a navy base on <laughs> top of a coral <laughs> reef. It's a different level of. Um, well, but, but that's the whole point of having this contract, right? Presumably, yeah. to transfer liability from the Dutch government to the NGL. Also that, and um, yeah, so the, the Dutch government is ultimately liable for. But the question is: Is any state politically willing to take the Dutch government to court for? The ocean cleanup. I mean, with all due respect, but it's <laughs> it's it, uh, up to, I think not something that they would want to have a huge political row over. I mean, these no, this is very right. political. Yeah, it's a political decision ultimately, and you often find being weaker states such as the Philippines against China, where it's sort of their ultimate final call of the last resort to. Yeah. As a note in the context as well, it's important to note that the U.S. is not part of the UNCLOS. Oh, they didn't sign it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <We're sorry. Yeah. laughs> because exactly because of that dispute settlement part, so they did not want to be taken to compulsory dispute settlement. Which doesn't mean that I mean the US comply with all the rest of the convention. And they've always done. So then that is a funny thing under international law, which we call customary international law, is that you if you always apply to obligations you haven't officially signed up to, you're still regarded to be bound by them. But that's a different discussion. Yeah, Rebecca. I, know, just yeah. Um, I was just wondering, and maybe you could help me understand this too. So, when you import the plastic into Camp Canada, is that Vancouver? Is that where it's landing, like regularly? No, not regularly. I mean, we now, for for the first time, landed a, a, a load of plastic. Okay. So, so. And it's not to be imported in Canada. It's uh -huh. to be transferred to Europe. Okay. So, is it? So I was reading your paper. It's it's trash on the high seas, but then it becomes a resource when you 
that's uh, it actually be based on prevention because of the them as well. So because of transport of waste, there's a convention on what waste you can transport and where, which then kicks in if you were to move it from one country to another. If you have a vessel out mm -hmm. at the ocean and you uh, have uh, food scraps and all sorts of waste, when you enter a port you have to hand it in and it's called international waste and most countries actually destroy it. Uh, because they don't know the origin and they don't want to be bothered to check and maybe it's a, a danger to whatever ecological system or other environmental factors in their country. So generally international waste from a vessel is destroyed. Destroyed by incinerated Quite often it's incinerated. <coughs> yeah. I don't know many different ways of destroying waste, to be honest. But yeah. uh, so quite often it is incinerated to make sure that it will not harm or not form a risk uh, on any agriculture or, or what sort of other application it could be. However, this material is not international waste because it's not generated on board of a vessel purchased from food scraps. In, in, uh, in, in, that's just not the case. So it has a bit of a separate uh, status and it's unprecedented because nobody generally picks up gar of, uh, uh, garbage, plastic, out in the middle of the ocean. And, uh, no, it falls in a legal yeah. void essentially. Yeah. It's one of these questions that has not been addressed. So it doesn't really fit under any particular. Um, rule. 